Doctors, Sean Steele, good to see everybody. Good to, good to get this going. It's kind of a new uh, world for me and Sam, uh, but you know what? In uh, changing times, uh, we got to adapt with the time. So we offer a special mini PI seminar. So Alex and I have put something together for the next few minutes that we have with you. We're going to give you a break. I don't know why uh, Sam insists on that, but uh, I lost in a, in a very close vote. Uh, but we're going to talk about uh, I, what I want to, landmarks, uh, special areas of PI that you might not have thought about. So I, we changed to a completely original outline because I got to keep it interesting for me. Uh, I think Sam and I are both planning to get out in the field in August for sure. Uh, because that's, you know, you know the face-to-face -face where we get the energy, we get to talk to you is a lot better. And plus, I think the numbers and statistics are looking a much, much better. So got to be realistic. But Sam and I need to, uh, need to think about chiropractic 24-7. That's what we do. So let's go through those 11 steps I'm going to do with Alex, my, my colleague. It'd be kind of fun. So first, the PI email alert. You can't really enjoy personal injury unless you get a copy of that. We put it out twice a month. We try. Not always, but uh, we got some nice inside gossip about PI lawyers who are publicly saying things that are nasty about chiropractors to other PI lawyers. So I, you, you need to know that uh, not all lawyers hate, PI lawyers hate chiropractors, but, but a significant share do, maybe 50%. That's a large number. So keep that in mind. When you're working with lawyers and you don't know them, there's a 50-50 chance they're not going to be nice to you when it comes time to pay. Uh, so you, so so we, we we cover that. We also got a great study. Oh my God! And we you know we've always heard intuitively that uh, women have suffer more in, in an accident than men. Uh, we know the usual reasons. There's a whole book about that now, written by a brilliant author. Uh, that uh, so we 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 give some good excerpts on that. Some hard data, and I think it's a good thing to teach her female patients that they're going to be hurting and treating a lot longer than their male counterparts. That's just what the science and the data uh, provides. So those are the kind of the uh, things that we want to uh, uh, we want to inform you about. There's a new scam of some outfit in Tennessee that wants to uh, make a deal with an insurance company on your PI case and they pay you 50 bucks uh, for an initial examination. It's a real scam. They promise to pay you in full for PI, but they don't pay you very much and they limit you to 20 visits. But we give you the, the name, the address, and the phone number of that group. So get your PI email alert. If you don't have it or you're not subscribed to it or you changed your email address, it's easy. Just email me directly, Sean Steele at SeanSteele.com. Love to have you. All right. So what we need to uh, do here is, uh, thank you. Um, I, I usually go through a whole setup about, you know, what the kind of accident you know, when you get a PI, let's talk about it and see what it really is. And I'm just going to make it real brief. Whenever you get a new PI case, you just have to make a quick, smart judgment about what you have. You got to make sure it's a clean case, liability-wise. That follows with a police report. 90% of the cases you get will have a police report. If they don't, you better worry a little and talk to the attorney. Find out if it's a real impact or not that could have caused injuries. And then your big job is once you know those two things, you're going to learn about it when you take the history. What are the injuries? How serious are these injuries? And that's, that's where you start a program that starts managing the case to get your bills paid. Because here's what we're doing. PI is going to be your best source of income in the next five years for 80% of the chiropractors. That's a fact of life. I can't predict much anything else, but for five years at least, PI is going to be your best single source of income. If that's true, how do we do that, protect it, and make sure that some other force doesn't go and take your money from you? That's, so that's, oh, wait, so I got my own mouse. Well, well, well. So I want us first to have a car accident, a couple of them. John Talian, my associate for only 29 years, uh, <laughs> has, the, has uh, found these great videos here. This is what's changing personal injury. Uh, this is what's really enhancing our case. I want you to st uh, stay focused. This is a, uh, 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 a friend of ours who was on a motorcycle. And he's got a he's got a cam on his on his helmet, right? Well, look at the uh, look at what happens to the Jeep, and it's pretty striking because you know videos tell oftentimes they misrepresent. That's that's a fact, but by and large they give more information uh, about a traffic accident. Uh, 
then, then a sterile police report. So let's see what happens here. I'm going to see if this works. I'm told. It works. So he's, he's in his motorcycle. He's just kind of minding his own business. That car's kind of parked weirdly off to the left, to left there. And watch the red car. He doesn't like that bus in front of him, it looks like. There's a big fat bus, and there comes the Jeep. And what is the bus going to do? He's probably going to slow down, and this guy wants to avoid the bus, and he does. Am I talking the Jeep way up in the air and, and knocking it down? Now, this is a good example where people will say, well, there's not much damage on the Jeep, so why is the patient seeing the doctor so much? Well, biomechanically, you can see it was a pretty big deal and so pretty impressive. And so, uh, uh, and, and so it changes the context of the case altogether. Let me show you the next uh, one that we got. I'm proud of this one. No, next one. And this is now, you got to watch this carefully. It's going to be in the upper part of the screen, in the upper left hand part of the screen up over here. Uh, this we got out of uh, Alameda County. And it's again, it's, it's a camera that's fixed to a station. As you know, we're under surveillance all the time. You know, the Chinese Communist Party is watching us every minute of the day. So that's just an, another example. Uh, so I want you to have a look and see what story is unfolded here. So. Looks like a normal day, beautiful day in the bay and the car's just driving down and whoa, it, oh my God. Now who's at fault? That's pretty obvious. The guy was just enjoying a beautiful day. He went through, <laughs> went through a traffic signal and, and what happened at the tra traffic signal is that three cars were turning and he, had, you know, he, he managed to damage at least two of the three cars, if not all three cars. So again, it, would, it could have been a he said, she said kind of situation. We're getting a lot of those videos in. Sometimes the patients don't even know there's a video. Sometimes, so we have to dig with our investigators to see if there's a video on a, on a case that might have some question marks on it. It really makes a big difference. So I just wanted to give you an idea of, you know, the te technology is growing. And when you have good evidence, uh, it makes a stronger case. I have a stronger case, you get paid. Every one of the themes that I'm going to talk about, <coughs> pardon me, is how to get paid. Now, next, I don't talk about this very often, but good lawyers, even bad lawyers, they all depend on you for patient control, patient management. What does that mean? Well, chiropractors, unlike most doctors, spend time with their patients, and that gives you an enormous advantage. I can't tell you how valuable that is to me, the PI lawyer. If they gain your confidence, they'll listen to you. They'll trust you. But you got to tell them how the personal injury world works. Insurance companies are bad. They delay. They don't pay. They deny. And they got to be really, really patient. And uh, then once in a while, a client's going to say, well, you know, I, I got hurt. Where's my money? Well, explain to him that he's got to finish treatment first. And then there has to be a report. And then the lawyer's got to negotiate it. Once in a while, a client will have a legitimate or even a not a legitimate argument or problem uh, or concern with their lawyer. Let me know. Let the lawyer know. Text me. Text the lawyer. Let the lawyer know. Hey, patient's upset. He's thinking of uh, dropping you. I don't want him to drop you because you signed a lien. So warn the lawyer when the patient's losing patience. Huh, that's a good one. Why don't you quote me on that? Uh, that that would be important to know. And just basically, they have to perform too. They got to show up on time. They got to follow your instructions. If you're making referrals for their own good, they should be listening to that. Uh, I, I'll tell you right now, 90% of, of you folks are doing that right now. But I want you to know on my side of the world, that's a really, really big deal. So I appreciate that. Okay, we're having a little, oh, that's a right click, left click. Oh, okay, I think we, okay, number three. This is a Sam Collins special, and I'm going to take credit for it. That's not fair. Sam has spent years and going through the ICD-10, he's the world's best lecture on ICD-10 codes for, uh, for chiropractors. And he's isolated 200 of the best trauma codes. Now, a lot of times I talk about this in some length. I say, hey, this is a good code. Use this one, use that one. I'll just tell you right now, we don't have time to do that today. But there's 200 good codes that Sam has published. And yes, he's a nice guy. He'll send it to you. But I'll send it to you faster because he gave me a copy. Email me, seansteel at seansteel.com, and you will get for free 200 of the best trauma codes uh, that you should be using in PI. If you, you shouldn't, in my view, 
for any PI case, you should not be using the normal headache codes, the normal musculoskeletal codes, because it doesn't evoke a trauma diagnosis. We need to talk about trauma and trauma cases. So you get those codes, email them to me, we'll send them to you right away. You look at them, it makes, it's a lot better than going through 60,000 codes. Now, here's, here's a hook here, and, and maybe Sam will talk about this later on. He's doing it again. He's reviewing the ICD-10. I think he's gonna add and subtract some, some uh, very shortly, uh, and it'll be much more definitive. It's, it's a brilliant piece of work that Sam has done. And once again, he's just giving it away and I'm grateful to him and I'm grateful to have the honor of working with Sam. He's really one of the best uh, chiropractic advocates and, and uh, an articulate one, uh, articulate spokesman I, I, I've met. All right, next, uh, we're going to bring in a really smart guy uh, besides me. Um, He's somebody that I've uh, worked with for a couple of years now. Uh, he's become a fierce chiropractic uh, advocate. Uh, he talks to chiropractors who are not our clients every single day. People, you should always call us for free and for fun about PI questions. Don't call us about divorce. We don't like divorce, very expensive and uh, you'll lose. Uh, don't call us about criminal cases. Uh, we think if a criminal is accused of being a criminal, he ought to go to jail. So we're very bad on that. Don't call us for uh, fish and game problems, admiralty problems, immigration problems, or workers' comp. We don't even know what the hell they're talking about in workers' comp, but we do love talking about PI. That's what we live for. We get up in the morning, we're thinking about PI. We go to sleep at night. I think it's one of the most exciting subjects in all of Western civilization. However, Alex has got a little bit of time that he wants to spend with you on uh, ADFs. If you don't know what that is, you're about to find out. My colleague, my good friend, great guy. Uh, I just have lots of fun working with him. He, uh, he gets a lot of good things done. Alex Eisner, would you please step in your chair here? Sure. All right. Oh. I'm reminded that I'm shorter than Sean. I'm going to raise your chair up a little bit, and you're going to have to bring it back down. Um, well, hello, everybody. Um, and uh, I, I want to mirror Sean's sentiments about Sam. He's uh, not that any of you need uh, to be told this, but uh, Sam is by far and away uh, one of our favorite people to work with with these, uh, with these seminars because he just uh, has such good quality information. And also, he seems to have a passion for billing codes uh, that is uh, borderline not human. So uh, that's always nice. Um, I am going to talk about ADFs. This is the first of a couple of slides that I have. Um, and it's by far the most controversial. This one gets me in trouble pretty much every time uh, I talk about it. Um, so I give the, the preface that this is not my opinion. Uh, this isn't what I think you should be paid or what I believe your services are worth. This is based upon my understanding of, uh, of dealing with adjusters uh, and, and opposing counsel in, in these PI cases. So what they do, because they're not very smart, is they take the total number of treatments for a case and they divide it by the total cost. And they come up with this thing called average daily fee. Now your average daily fee is, uh, is like I just said, it's an average. So obviously, your initial consultations, these initial visits, they're going to be a lot, uh, maybe not a lot, but they're certainly going to be more expensive than maybe your last couple of treatments, which hopefully are fewer modalities and, and a little bit less expensive. But on average, um, they come up with this ADF and they, they use it at, uh, against me. If, you, if the average daily fee comes in between $100 and $150 uh, a visit, I call it low risk. In other words, I, I don't get a lot of pushback on those. Uh, if I if it comes in between 150 and 200 dollars, sometimes I'll get some pushback, but most of the time they'll tell me you know that's that's probably about right. If it's over 200 dollars and as your average daily fee, I'm getting a lot of pushback, um, a lot. Like like they're telling me ah oh, you know this is this is bogus and we're not going to pay for this and you know no jury we're going to bring in a billing expert this whole whole thing. Um, I tell you this because I want your bills to get paid. Again, not because I don't think your services are worth $200, $300, $400. I mean, it's, it's certainly I've seen, uh, seen chiropractic reports and, 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 uh, uh, that, that show a treatment plan uh, that was aggressive and effective, um, where the chiropractor was in the, in the room with a patient for an hour or more a visit. And I feel like they probably deserve uh, 200 or more. 
This is just based on my experience of how likely a risk your bill is of getting pushed back and potentially not getting paid. So this is the, uh, this is the breakdown of, of average daily fee as far as we've seen it so far. Now, um, in terms of a treatment curve, uh, and we call it a treatment curve, your, your standard run-of-the-mill PI case looks, could look something like this. Now, I, I, I always joke about how funny it is that I, I say the following phrase as often as I do, but I am not a doctor. So, you know, you, you guys are going to ultimately be the ones determining how, many, uh, how much treatment an, an individual needs. But your standard run-of-the-mill PI case, nothing crazy. Uh, you know, no, no, no extraordinary TBIs, no broken bones, but also not your missed case. This is your real, you know, real case. A, a, a treatment, uh, you know, a, a treatment curve could look like this, where the first couple of months you're seeing the patient person uh, twice a week. So that's about eight visits a month. Next couple of months, three, four, uh, month three, month four, once a week. So that's four times a month. Last couple of months, month five, month six, you're only doing two visits a month. So once every other week. This comes out at about 28 dates of service. Uh, if you're on the high end of the green zone at $150 as an ADF, you're looking at about $4,000 or so as a chiropractor, as, as your bill. The other, uh, which is by the way, fantastic and gonna get paid most of the time, especially if, if you know, you've got a good attorney. Um, but uh, the other thing this helps us do is, is stretch out the treatment a little bit. Um, you know, you could do 28 dates of service in two or three months if, if, you, if you packed them all in there. But obviously, then we, then we lose out on this length of treatment. And, and, you know, four or five, six months of treatment, it really helps us with the argument that this person is in pain and, and suffered, you know, serious injuries. And it, and it often helps the patient, uh, you know, get, learn how to incorporate some of the uh, at-home exercises and stretches and things that you'll inevitably be teaching them and then continue to come in every so often for, for follow-up. So uh, this is, this is a, a treatment curve that we, uh, that we recommend on you know, a standard case where it's staggered, you know, large number of visits at the beginning and then less and then less and, until you release them from treatment uh, at the end. Um, emotional injuries, okay. Um, we do a whole PowerPoint, we do a whole lecture on TBI, um, and I do a whole lecture on the benefits of uh, neurologists, neuropsychologists, psychiatrists, psychologists. Um, but I just wanted to touch on, on, on one in, in this lecture here, which is, which is marriage and family therapists. So the, they're, they're underutilized, in my opinion. And if you find a good one in your area that, that works well with chiropractors, that, that is you know, a reasonable uh, in, in their amount of both the amount of treatment and the and the billing for that treatment they can work a lot of a magic on a pi case on the one hand their reports can be great uh, and very helpful in in explaining some of the emotional injuries that a car accident can have but on the other side of it they can be great in terms of actually getting your patient better uh, you know psychologically um, what you're looking for is an extreme emotional reaction so at, at, at you know after you've done pi for a little while you start to get a sense of the range of emotional reactions and and i hear from chiropractors all the time that they end up you know playing just as much a role as a counselor and life coach as they do as chiropractor um, because when they're in there you're, you're talking with your patients a lot ask them ask them about their emotional reaction to the accident ask them how they're doing um are they having you know nightmares are they reliving the accident are they uh, do, do they seem particularly distraught about an accident that happened you know three four five six months ago this can be a sign that there's a little more going on under the surface than your standard run-of-the-mill emotional you know, response to a car accident. I'm not talking about post-traumatic stress disorder. I'm not talking about people who you know, can't get back in the car, who, are, you know, who, who haven't slept in, in weeks. I'm, I'm not talking about that kind of reaction. We could, do, we could go on a whole tangent about the role of psychologists and psychiatrists. I'm talking about the people who are still having an emotional reaction much too long after the accident or uh, are, are, are fixated on a particular part of the accident uh, you know, over and over again. This, this kind of thing uh, is the perfect purview of a marriage and family therapist. And if you can find a good one, they will give us these great one-page 
one paragraph even reports that will really help us bolster our case. It's the type of thing that we can submit to uh, adjusters or even to opposing counsel and have them uh, really be able to quickly uh, identify the issue uh, and, and the, the, the reaction that this, the client or patient has had without them having to dig through a um, you know, long chiropractic, uh, I mean, a long psychological evaluation and these battery of test results. Um, so they really can be very, very valuable. Um, and obviously, the, the key to finding out if, uh, if an MFT is going to be effective in a case is uh, just talking to your client. Um, uh, I'm being passed a note, but I don't know what time it is. Oh, I'm 10.30. Well, it's, the note says I have until 10.35, which is weird because it's 12.22. So I'm very confused. But... Um, <laughs> Um, okay, well, that's, uh, that's, that's a good, good amount of time. I will see if I can fill up that much time. Um, what to do with the sub in attorney. Okay. So this is, uh, this is, this is, this is a great thing to talk about because we, we end up talking a lot about, um, vetting of attorneys and how to vet them so that you are, uh, you know, you, you get a sense right up front in a case, whether or not somebody is going to you know, take care of you in the end, or if they have respect for chiropractic, or if they're likely to screw you and stiff you on the bill. Um, and we, we've, I'm, uh, many of the people on this call have probably heard that spiel before. But one of the things we don't talk about very often is what happens if an attorney, uh, if, if your client or your patient subs out an attorney, um, oftentimes without even talking to you about it, and they sub in a new one, uh, halfway through the case or, or, or close or longer. Um, and so here's, here's the key to that. Uh, and the, the key piece of information is your lien that you had signed by the old attorney is not good anymore. Um, your, your client, your patient still signed it, so it's good as to them. And we'll, that'll become uh, operative in a minute. But it's not good as to the old attorney anymore. And because uh, obviously that attorney doesn't, isn't working on the case anymore. So the first thing you're going to want to do is get a new lien document, clean uh, lien signed by your patient and sent over to this new attorney. And you're going to need that uh, to get that signed before you do any more treatment with that patient. Um, and one of the things that we found to be effective is to enlist the help of your, your patient in this. Um, I, my policy on these things is the more communication you have with your patients about their case, the better. Uh, I'm not, you know, always in the majority when it comes to that, that viewpoint, but I think that the chiropractor being the, chi the quarterback of the case extends beyond just the realm of medicine uh, and into the realm of, of their actual lawsuit as well. And you should be involved. If they're going to fire their attorney, you should know about it uh, for at least. And you should be involved in, in, okay, well, if you need to, if you feel you need to do that, here's what needs to happen next. We're not going to be able to do any more treatment until you get the new attorney to sign my lien and explain to them why, because my old lien's not going to be good anymore. And, uh, and, and so I'm, I'm going to be, you know, hanging out on a limb here uh, when I go to try and get paid at the end of this case. But once you get that lien signed by that attorney, the next thing we would tell you to do is try to get that attorney on the phone and have a conversation with them. Catch them up to speed on where, you know, what's been going on with the treatment on the case, what's been going on with this client. Uh, if you had any issues with the prior attorney, talk to them about that and try and try and get uh, try and get those types of things cleared up in terms of uh, additional medical referrals that you think uh, that your patient might need. So all of these things are are the you know the purview of that first communication with that attorney. So you want to get your lien signed, then you want to get that attorney on the phone. And just like the the skunk test, the original vetting of of an attorney, uh, you're gonna you know, getting the attorney on the phone is really crucial. Uh, not, not their paralegal, not their assistant, uh, their actual, the attorney that's going to be working on the case. Um, because obviously that, that open line of communication is what prevents uh, and, and hopefully smooths out the, the relationship going forward. And, and hopefully that becomes a, a source of business for you, uh, assuming everything goes well. So you've gotten them to sign your lien, you've gotten them on the phone, everything's good to go. Let's say they don't sign your lien uh, and or you can't get them on the phone. That's why I said communicate with your patient. I said that before, I'm gonna say it again now because if they don't sign your lien, and you first need to explain to your patient why that's important. And we already talked about that because obviously now you're, you're being hung out to dry in terms of whether or not that, uh, that lien, uh, whether or not your bill is gonna be able to get paid in the end. 
But the other reason I want you to communicate with your patient is because if they don't sign that lien, the, the only remedy that I think you have open to you, well, you have two. One is to risk it all, risk, you know, toss the dice and, and, and hope for the best in the end of the case. Obviously, we don't recommend that, um, both as lawyers and as chiropractic advocates. But, um, but what I do think you can do and what you absolutely should do is explain to your client that unfortunately, because the lien that they signed with you says that, they, that your bill can come due at any time, that unfortunately, if their new attorney doesn't sign your lien, you're going to need them to pay their bill. Um, and so at that point, I would present them with a bill, uh, you know, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, whatever it is, we take credit cards, we'd happily, you know, payment plans, that whole nine. This will have a couple of effects. One, it will have the effect of informing your, your patient as to what the total bill even is, uh, which a lot of times they don't know. And I, I you know, not part of this particular slide or, or conversation, but uh, we always think it's good practice to let your patients know what your bill is every so often, uh, just so that they can, in their head, have an idea of the value of your services. This will help in the end, making sure you get paid. Um, it also helps when I'm sitting defending my client's deposition and they get asked, you know, have any idea how much you know money uh, Dr. So-and-so charged? Yeah, I do. I, I know exactly how much money they charged. I know exactly what treatment they rendered and why. So uh, it's important to have that line of communication with them. But um, having that uh, explaining to them that their bill uh, is, you know, hey, I, I wasn't able to get a hold of your new attorney uh, and or they were not willing to sign uh, this lien document. So I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately going to need to have this, uh, this bill paid by you because I can't guarantee that it'll be paid in the end. Um, I have a hunch, uh, and, and certainly this is how it's worked out in cases past, uh, that all of a sudden you will get your lien document signed by the attorney. Um, because the client is A, going to want more chiropractic treatment, which you're not going to be willing to render without a signed lien, and B, they're not going to want to pay three or $4,000 uh, or five or so, whatever your bill is, they're not going to want to pay that uh, come due Im immediately in the middle of their, of their case. Um, and, and, you know, you can certainly explain to them that this is not your doing, uh, that this is not, you know, some punitive measure, it's not a punishment, <laughs> that, this is, that this is just to protect you, that you've rendered services uh, with the understanding that you would be paid, you know, at, when the case resolved, that's why you were willing to do, you know, do work on lien. But that that assurance was backed up by the signature of both the client and an attorney. Without the signature of that attorney, you're free floating out in the universe, and and your client needs to understand that that your treatment is valuable, and that you're not, you know, you're not interested in gambling uh, with the value of your services. So, uh, you know, that conversation usually does resolve the issue. Um, so, uh, get the attorney to sign the lien, get the attorney on the phone. If you can't get them to sign, uh, to sign the lien, you're certainly going to communicate that to your uh, patient, explain to them why that's important. Uh, and, and the unfortunate reality is that your bill is going to need to get paid somehow, whether it be by the client or by the attorney, uh, signing the lien. I think that's the end of my, yeah, it is. Uh, so Sean, even though I'm, I'm either five minutes early or two hours late. I'm not sure which one. Um, Sean's going to come back in and talk to you about not avoiding the mis uh, not avoiding the big injuries. Mr. Steele. Wow. <laughs> we are uh, moving so quick. And uh, I hope you, I consider these um, PI nuggets. So it's not a big theme. It's like uh, almost a uh, uh, micro points that can influence your practice. Uh, and so we want to just have a, a variety of issues that, uh, that would pique your interest that you might not think about too often in a typical PI seminar. Boy, uh, you, you guys are being inundated with seminars coming out of our ears. I get them all the time. You get them all the time. So I'm grateful that you're here and you're showing up and you're sticking with us. Sam had, you know, Sam's usually right on. But uh, he, uh, he almost made a terrible mistake. He wanted us to have a break. I mean, you know, what are you going to do with a break? You know, just, you know, go to Starbucks across the street and you'll forget all about it. So uh, my philosophy is uh, we get a lot of work to do. We don't get a lot of time to spend together. We're going to enjoy every minute of each other. Okay, this is one of my pet peeves. Let's, let's avoid malpractice. And, and this, this is an issue that doesn't really, you know, involve 
real malpractice litigation, but it's something that we don't want to screw up on a perfectly good PI case. So this is the record I got from Kaiser Hospital. I put it in red. <clears throat> you might want to have a look at it. But he gives that I highlighted this doctor, emergency room doc at Kaiser, highlighted three issues that he was concerned about. Calf contusion. Oh, boy. That means he saw it. It's an injury. It's a body part. There's going to be a several uh, trauma diagnostic codes you can use. So that really opens the door because uh, oftentimes our, our personal injury uh, are not invisible. People don't see it. Uh, there, there's some skepticism when it comes to the public at large. Oh, he couldn't have got hurt. I don't see anything. Well, calf contusion takes that away. Secondly, possible L4 fracture. You see that? Well, now you got a fracture that's a lifetime injury. So it's a fracture case. Uh, I don't need giant bills when somebody breaks an arm, you know, uh, and, or, 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 or non-displaced fracture in the femur. Um, so they, they set it, and hopefully the bone grows back properly, but it's never going to be the same. It's going to be always uh, 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 more feeble. Uh, the structural integrity is, uh, is challenged. And so it's a very valuable case. Uh, no, no, no matter what the insurance companies say, juries buy it a lot. So I would apply that to a fracture, a compression fracture. And, and of course, it's just not going to heal naturally. Just, you know, there's, there, it depends on how extensive and how damaged that, that fracture is, but it's a, it's a big finding. But here's the thing that makes it potentially a six-figure case. And that's where it says right here, I'll circle it, closed head injury. Now, when a doctor in an emergency room believes it's a closed head injury, that is worth investigating. Let's, let's have a Let's talk about that. Let's sing about it. That's something that's terribly important. So that deserves a lot of investigation. Okay, fair enough. So patient is then referred to an orthopedist. And uh, I'll show you what the orthopedist had to say. Actually, I know Dr. Kyle Landauer. He's in Long Beach. And he, uh, he uh, gave us uh, a questionable L4 compression fracture. Well, okay, so he's confirmed his concern what, from the emergency room. So he needs uh, further studies, MRIs. Uh, that sort of thing. And so he needs to, he needs to get, he needs to answer that question. Then, so that's double confirmation by two MDs that don't know each other. Very powerful. Then he's got a right hand contusion. We didn't see that in the ER record. So he's added a body part, something that, uh, that probably by the time the patient saw, and we're having a jumping little scenario here. By the time the patient saw Dr. Landauer, I guess the, 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 the hand contusion was bruised, black and blue, and was easy to see. And then, of course, he <clears throat> reconfirms a left leg contusion. So Landauer did his job, but notice what he didn't speak about. Anything about the closed head injury? Not at all, because uh, he doesn't do heads. He does bones, and it makes sense. He's a specialist. We love specialists. Let's see. Let's see. Here. Yeah. Yeah. And so as, as such... Uh, when he is a specialist, uh, he's not going to be doing areas that are outside of his lane. Uh, so we got a we got a battle here. So we're we're going to win this battle. Just you know, we just want to make sure that you guys are awake and paying attention. All right, and this is what we got from the chiropractor <clears throat> when it first came to our our office, and uh, boy, what a disaster! Um, so as a chiropractor, bless us. So watch this thing. It's going to slide back and forth. Chiropractor instead of uh, giving us anything for, for the arms, he gives us a cervical sprain strain, <clears throat> referred pain in the upper arms, not true radiculitis. So, so, so once again, the chiropractic, maybe we need to keep our hand on it or something. I don't, I don't know what the deal is. But so, so what he did is he, that, that he took an important finding and just kind of relegated it into nothingness. Next, our good friend, uh, lumbar sprain strain, when 2MD said we have a compression fracture worth you know, we, we, we know that the chiropractor didn't, didn't do any studies, didn't do any, didn't do any extra work. And, and uh, sadly, he, he wasn't paying attention to what the ER records had to say. And then, of course, the closed head injury he took away as a uh, post-traumatic cephalgia. Uh, here's what happens in a real world in a case like this. Uh, I, I assure you this will never happen again. We're going to figure this out <clears throat> and not let the thing jump all over the screen. What happened is that the chiropractor took theoretically a hundred thousand dollar case and it reduced its value to seventy five hundred uh, by being lazy by not by not reviewing the uh, the records uh, by not uh, collaborating by not uh, talking to any other doctors he just treated it as a run of the mill ordinary no big deal pi case 
uh, you know, let, next case, please. So this is the worst thing we can do when you don't pay attention to what the other doctors have found and you're in charge of the case. It is entirely your case. Uh, you can't blame anybody else. This is self-inflicted wound. In fact, it's more than just shooting yourself in the, in the, in the foot, you're shooting yourself in the chest. So uh, this is something we don't wanna do, be very aware of it. <clears throat> in our practice, we send you the pictures of the car. <laughs> I don't know what we're gonna do here, Lisa. We send you the pictures of the car, we send you the police report, and we also send you the ER records. And we hope that you look at them. Please take a minute. We want every one of our doctors to know what we know, what the insurance companies know, what the evidence is going to show so you have a good idea of this. Okay, I guess that's a proper to say that I gotta move to the next item. Uh, I'm really big on this. If this thing keeps moving, we're just uh, maybe keep your finger on it or something. Um, build your triage team fast. So I like the Calvary. You know, the Calvary, Calvary, I always get that mixed up. Um, you know, they're supposed, to, they're the good guys who are supposed to come to our rescue. So uh, I, I, so I put it in a concept that every chiropractor is the manager, the chief doctor for a PI case, but he does need assistance. He needs a neurologist, maybe a neurosurgeon, maybe a plastic surgeon. This is important. Uh, and, and I really want us to understand we're not isolated. Nowadays, we live in a triage world. And it does so much good on your PI case when you work with, get this, quality pro-chiropractic MDs. There are some MDs that are not high quality and, you know, they come from the workers' comp field. Be, beware, they're, they run machines, you know, all the reports look alike, everybody needs a shot, so I, 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 they're dodgy. I need you to have personal relationships with just a few doctors, three or four. If you know three or four, those three or four can refer you to 50 because they work with MDs all day long referring to each other. So I want you to build your own personal team and I will help you for free because it's important that chiropractors have a team that can make the PI case work. Now, this is a Sean Steele rule. You won't find this in too many workbooks. My rule is you work with an MD that justifies more chiropractic care. Any MD that says something snarky about chiropractors and their adjustments is an enemy. It'll hurt you, it'll hurt the case. And uh, I keep a list of every MD that does PI in California. I don't have all of them, but I have a pretty comprehensive list and I, I, I update it every single day. And I grade the MDs. They do something, any chiropractic, they go down in, in value. If they're, if they're consistently good, they testify well and, and they help the case and they work with the chiropractor, their numbers go up. And of course they have to take liens. These are lean doctors. The private doctor, too expensive for most of our patients. So you build your triage team fast. That means newcomers, guys that have been around for 20 years plus, you, you need to have a team that you can depend on. So that's important. Now, here are some of the ones, here are some of the specialists that I like. Uh, and again, uh, the reasons are officially to serve the patient, to get authority for more DC care. By the way, good MDs will say, yeah, this patient needs more chiropractic care. I don't want them to say six more visits. I don't want that kind of micromanagement, but I need them to say, hey, this patient is, is doing well, making progress, but needs more chiropractic care. Um, and to get a list of medical options for the DC. So this is what I do. Every time there's a new case, you and I will talk. And I will talk to you that uh, how much insurance there is, how clean the case is. Uh, we'll look at some of the patient's pre-existing or morbidities, and we'll see what seems to be appropriate for the case, but you have to agree to it. So we have the list on the left. That includes psychiatrists, internists, uh, neuropsychologists. There's all sorts of specialties depending upon the issue and the diagnosis. And I'm hoping that you start building up this list. Most of you have a couple of guys, but I talk to doctors every day. And sometimes I say, geez, I used to work with bone cutter and I haven't seen him in five years. So that, you know, we need to, we need to beef it up. Also non-MDs is perfectly good. For example, DAC bars. It's crazy to let, to have you, to allow for you to have a, uh, uh, an x-ray read by a, an MD. They, they can't read x-rays for personal injury for chiropractors, in my opinion. They don't do a good job. They're looking for bullet shots. They're looking for cancer. They're not looking for muscular skeletal problems. I love DAC bars. 
Once in a blue moon, you'll have a dental case. Better have a dentist on, on online. With dentists, they're, they're tricky because they're, they're nice people. They're doing, they're very successful, but they're illiterate. So you're gonna have to write them two sentences uh, so they can put it on their report. Like, it is my opinion that the patient was injured in an auto accident because they broke teeth 10 and 11. That's all they have to say. Physical therapist, if you have a good one, uh, that, that would be appropriate for maybe a week or two if, if for, if for a tough patient. Uh, physical therapists, good ones are hard to find. Acupuncturists, more plentiful. And again, some patients may want to do that. You reach a certain plateau, the patient's still four out of 10. You might want to consider, under your authority, <clears throat> referring them to an acupuncturist you know so the patient doesn't self-refer and you lose them. Try them out for two weeks and come back uh, for, for chiropractic uh, care. So these are some thoughts. You have the power to make the referrals. These guys here on the left, uh, the psychiatrist, the internist, the plastic surgeon, they're just, they, they have one limited specialty and uh, they're not necessarily even familiar with each other. You're the general. Now, this is my private list. These are real names. <laughs> I shouldn't even show it to you, but I thought I'd get I have this list that's color coded. <clears throat> These are doctors in a part of uh, Los Angeles. Now it's changed. It's, I constantly change this one. In fact, I can see one of the doctors I simply took off the list. He's no longer practicing. The point is I have to know who's on your team because you call me and say, Sean, I could sure use an ENT guy. I say, well, ENT guys are rare. They don't take liens, but uh, your patient may have to travel. Or, Sean, I could sure use a neurologist, but the only good one I know is in Orange County, but my patient's up in L.A. I will help you for free and for fun, but, well, not entirely for free. Here's the deal. You want to hear what the deal is? If I give you a name of a particular patient, I mean of a particular MD, you have to give me one. So, in other words, I'm looking to build my list, keep it updated, uh, keep it current. Uh, so, if we have a... Uh, uh, you have a good pro-chiropractic MD, I'd be happy to add them to my list and I'll give you uh, the doctors that you need for your particular patient. It doesn't have to be my case, that's just what we do. So keep that in mind. For example, notice Beverly uh, radiology on the left. I don't like them. I don't like them because they do a lousy job, in my opinion, of uh, reading x-rays, reading MRIs, they're superficial, uh, they, uh, they, they, they don't go into the heart of the matter, I get very little information, but expert on the other hand, I think they're great. Uh, they're fast and they give me enormous amount of detail. So again, this is my subjective opinion based upon, you know, the experience and such. So that's just a gift. I have the statewide. I got it from Reading to El Centro, from San Diego to Lake Tahoe. That's not true. I don't think I have any pro chiropractic uh, MDs in Lake Tahoe, but I, I can work on that. So keep that in mind. Call me, Alex, or uh, John. We're the three that will talk to the chiropractors directly on this kind of stuff. Well, I love this one. You've probably been hearing rumors about blow up the policy or bust the policy. And I'm going to or blow out the policy. So what does that mean? Well, most insurance companies, no, all insurance companies have limits that they'll pay no matter what, how bad the damages are. And since 1972, the California legislature in the, in the pocket of the insurance companies has not changed the minimal insurance. It's $15,000, no matter how much damage the defendant causes. So typically, $15,000 since 1972 is a lot less valuable today than it was what, what, 40 years ago? Crazy, 40 or 50 years ago. So th th it's, it's been not a good thing for consumers. Uh, and what drives me crazy is that I'll have a perfectly decent bill at $5,000 and the patient suffered a lot. The insurance companies won't pay 15. I said, are you kidding? They treated six months. You know, they didn't get all the bells and the whistles. They didn't get this, they didn't get that, but it was a big accident. Sorry, $5,000, we don't think it's a policy case. And what a dilemma. Do I want to go to court and superior court and spend $20,000 to get $15,000? The client's not going to make any money. So we need a, uh, a bolder approach to getting that minimal policy. Now, it's not just 15. Some, a lot of people have 25,000 insurance or 50,000. Frankly, every day, Lisa, come over here and say hi. I want you to just say hi. See that? 
that brilliant gal, she is the one, she is my policy buster specialist. You didn't know that, did you? She is sending out demand letters saying, you gotta pay the policy limits or we're gonna end your insurance company. We are gonna take it over. We're gonna, once we sue you and we make a bunch of money suing you, we'll take it over. We're gonna fire everybody, particularly you who are not paying our patients. So, uh, so we set that up, we have a whole protocol and, uh, and, but I need help from you. How do I blow up the policy? Well, it means no matter what, uh, on most cases that are moderate to severe injuries with people over 50, that's the, that's the rubric. If you got a 50 year old person, plus it's a moderate or severe accident and uh, there's $15,000, I'm going to get it every single time with your help. You and I will talk what are the reasonable medical bills, We'll talk about reasonable referrals. I love MRIs. I love MRIs, the state of the art, uh, particularly, in, but you better find some, you know, find some good justification for the MRIs. Uh, but if we put it together, we routinely, uh, good luck, John. He thinks I'm going to end in a couple of minutes. Is he crazy? You know, sorry, Sam, we love you, Sam, but hey, look, uh, no, no breaks. Okay, if you need a break, you can go any time. I'm not going to know, but we're not taking those stinking breaks because we got work to do. You know, your time's valuable. All right, back to the ranch. So help me blow out the policies. You work closely with the attorney. MRIs really help blow up the policies. Uh, and, and, uh, and ultimately, the, the purpose is when you blow up the policy, be very careful that the attorney does it right or you're going to find your fee slashed in half. And uh, I, I, uh, there was a, a popular seminar running around. That's uh, where uh, the, the, the attorneys and a chiropractor was telling people you can only bill $2,500. And that's crazy. It depends on the patient. It depends on the level of service. There's no rule on that. Uh, so just, just work closely with the attorney, but help us blow out the policy because we do that, I don't know, three or four times a week. Yeah. I mean, at least three or four times a week, almost one a day, not quite one a day. All right, finally, uh, oh, I love this stuff. This is radical stuff, and, and I want you to look at it. I, and I have to be careful. I don't like pictures. He's a good-looking guy and got messed up. Looked like he was a, in an English uh, soccer tournament. But, uh, no, he was in an auto accident, and you can see you know, the evidence is pretty stark. It's a classic seatbelt injury. Lucky he's young. Yes. Lucky he's young. Lucky, uh, but, the, but the visible scar, uh, well, potential scars, the abrasions are clear and obvious. And of course, that's the picture I'm sending to the insurance company. Even before the patient's done much treatment, because I want to set a stage. I want the insurance company to have a very high level of respect for this case because I want it to settle easy and fast. So I don't hide the evidence, I disclose it. So, you know, I have 50 rules of steel. If you want a copy of that, I'd be happy to send it to you. There's something else I was gonna send you on, I forgot. But 50 rules of steel, every iconoclastic basic rule of PI, I'd be happy to send to you for free and for fun. We can do it by email, seansteel at seansteel.com. One of the rules is, if you can see it, you better shoot it. What does that mean, Alex? That's right, you gotta take pictures. If you can see it, you better shoot it. So take the pictures. Now, if it's a female, the husband should take the picture. I don't care what body part it is. Husband takes a picture, the boyfriend takes a picture. I don't know of a single case where females said, no, I, I don't wanna take a picture of my big you know, hematoma in the black and blues. They all understand why it's important. So that's what I mean by the hook. Now, Alex knows what a hook is, he, he's a musician. Give me an example of a famous song that has a hook. How about Buddy Holly and the Rockets and that solo drum that's in the background and, and it was such a drum beat or Jimi Hendrix and the first note, you know it's a Jimi, oh, that sounds like a boomer thing. Do you have anything you know, a little bit younger? He doesn't, unfortunately. A uh, Jack Johnson, just his first voice, but there's a hook that get, immediately gets your attention. Same thing with P.I. I need a hook. Your job, find me a hook. So I can sell, sell, literally that's what I do, I sell the case. If I can't sell it uh, at, with the adjuster, I'm happy to sue and we'll sell it in mediation or arbitration. By the way, 95% of the cases that go to litigation are settled in arbitration and mediation. You'll be lucky if you get a trial the next year, particularly with the COVID panic. You'll be lucky to get a, a trial. I mean, it's less than 1%, so, uh, so 
But again, trial lawyers have to sell. That's, that's what I did. Did you ever find me a hook? How about the smoke on the water? Yeah, smoke on the water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you can see the smoke. All right. What the hell are you talking about? What's that? Bum, 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 bum. That's a boomer song. But yeah, smoke on the water. But you'll, you'll, you'll understand. Um, okay, now here's what I want you to focus on. I'm going I'm to close with this. Is Sam ready? Sam, I don't, how come I don't see Sam? I'd like to see Sam. Is he good? You know. He's a good-looking guy. Oh, there's Sam. That's not Sam. That's a picture I took of Sam. Oh, there he is. Sam, almost. I'm not done. I'm not done. You don't have to yell at him. I can hear you. What, what? Well, he's, <laughs> he's got his thumb up. Okay. Now, I like it when patients have big, fat problems before the accident. So, so what if they had prior surgery? You know, it's the same old stuff to you, the insurance company. says, well, he's got pre-existing injuries. Yeah, damn right. Don't hit him, you moron. You have my client that had a surgery three years ago, and, it, and it's, he's falling apart. It's your fault, and you got to pay extra. So I consider pre-existing a big deal. We handle it right. Diabetes, he's been an insulin-dependent diabetic. Big deal, slower to, hit, slower to heal. Cancer survivor in remission, wonderful. Don't hit a cancer survivor. It makes everybody nervous and uncomfortable, but you get the idea. That's the hook. Find me that hook, something special about the patient. John signs up a case in, uh, and uh, uh, signing up a case in San Francisco. Uh, so he's going to meet a, a client in a coffee shop. So, you know, sounded like pretty good. Wanted to meet the client, interview the client, learn about the case, good place report. And we find out that the patient is a quadriplegic in a coffee shop that had a specially built car where she could drive. She had a perfectly independent lifestyle. You know, done. Whatever you want, you get. She, she was smart. She, 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 she adapted to life very well. She was endearing. And John was shocked. He walks into the restaurant, and there's this woman, you know, in a specially built uh, a car, the quadriplegic, and she had a car accident. It was her. Well, you know, that, that you know, you just... Take take that down to to you know take that down to the courthouse and you're gonna walk away with uh, with half half the building, uh, and then there's other radical events tractor trailer cases always a slam dunk winner. Uh, unfortunately, it's a loser for the patient because they get hurt. You know, <laughs> I even got a surgery case in Fresno that uh, was a tractor trailer on a tractor trailer. So tractor trailers, big things. They they hurt a lot of people and they have a million dollars insurance. Drunk drivers. Can't get enough. Love them. They want to, they want to, how about dope drivers? You know, they're, they're smoking dope and they're tested. Boom. Good case. Nobody likes uh, Matt, mothers against drunk driving. Bizarre accidents. We have a case in Fairfax in Los Angeles where one car hits another and the defendant's car literally went flying in the air and landed on top of my client's car. Big case. Uh, we're getting very close to arbitration on them. Bizarre accidents are fun. Hit and run. Uh, nobody's around to say they didn't do it, so you're going to win those visible marks like our gentleman here. Uh, those are some of the thoughts. Uh, Sam, I, I just, you know, I didn't want to go rogue, but it's, uh, we're right on time. We're, we're going to get you in here early. Sam, I, I want you to do something. Please, dear God, tell these chiropractors how to bill and code in person. No problem. I am ready. Let me go ahead and uh, set up so you can see my screen. Let's yep. get you going here. You're looking good. Okay. Let's come on. And I'm just moving. I need to enlarge it. It's moving around on me a little crazy. So there we go. All right. Here we go, everyone. Well, thanks for spending some time with Sean and I. It's important for us to keep you moving because at the end of the day, uh, particularly for me, I do continuing education seminars. And of course, we're doing them all. So if you need hours, we're doing all ours, all of our seminars, though they'll be virtual for this much and this month and next. We'll have all continuing education. So take a look at the location. In fact, you can go anywhere. We'll be in Hawaii, technically. It'll have California hours. But we'll be here. We'll be back live in August. But until then, all the hours still count. Now, what I want to focus on obviously today has been personal injury. And I'm going to say this. If you're not doing personal injury during this time, you better start. I don't think I'm probably having to convince anyone listening to us today. And that reason, I think, uh, for that is the money is going to change. When the economy is down, and I saw something today that the economy rebound for California is going to be like the Nike swoosh, not like a, you know, a big check mark. 
And I suspect that, so we're gonna see a lot of changes. What's the one thing that's not going to change? What's not going to change is personal injury. People are gonna be hurt, good legitimate access, pay well, but our problem is how do we make sure we deal with the audit side of it, the, the back door looking at it? And that's kind of what I wanna focus on, and that's why I call this kind of bulletproofing, if you will. The one thing I'll say about chiropractic, of course, is think of how much we've grown. It's now a jeopardy question to have chiropractors. But personal injury, I always will say, you've got to focus on what's there. It's an accident or trauma. In the absence of an accident or trauma, they're going to question why they're being seen. So here, I'll give an example. A patient has headaches. They're involved in an accident and they still have headaches. Is the insurance company for the accident thinking they're the cause or if they were having headaches before? So we have to make sure that we're showing that we're treating something that is related to the accident. So don't be afraid to use trauma codes. In fact, I'm going to say you must use trauma codes. If you do not, it's going to be a problem. You're not going to get paid well. You're not going to get paid at all because there's got to be a reason. Now, what is this? You may not always be treating personal injury, but when you do, you code injuries. What you don't need are codes like this. Notice this code says you're a driver of a car injured in a sport utility vehicle. Or how about the passenger? or crushed between a passenger ship. There's all types of codes for everything if you're hit by a golf club. Here's one that I think is kind of interesting. Take a look at Z62.0, inadequate parental supervision. Wow, being a bad parent. But notice, this is what I call the Lori Laughlin uh, varsity blues diagnosis. Parental overprotection, paying the kids their way to get into school. I think some of these codes are funny. They actually add nothing to the claim the insurance company already knows it's an accident. Therefore, using this doesn't help. What helps is what is wrong with the patient, which means there's got to be strains and sprains. Strains and sprains are good codes. It's what occurs. Now, the problem is sometimes people think, I don't want to use a sprain strain because it's limited. Well, it is. Sprain strains are going to get better even if you don't treat them. The goal would be we get them well faster but more importantly, we get it to restore itself back to pre-injury status, our hope. But remember, that's not the only thing. And this is where we, I think, go off track. Remember, there's going to be a sprain or a strain. And I always want to highlight sprains and strains are tears. Many times people, what if I rupture a ligament? It's a sprain. If you rupture a muscle, it's a strain. One is joint. One is going to be more muscle, meaning pain on active and passive, meaning a joint. Whereas if you have pain only on active, probably the muscle. Here's what I want to highlight. You've got to start making your way to make sure the strain sprains are graded. Take a look at this. This is from the auto insurance specialist, which is a company that oversees a lot of uh, auto cases that you all have dealt with. And notice here it says, upon reviewing the file, serious consideration of the individual's mechanism of injury, objective findings, diagnostic impressions, recommendations of guidelines, and case studies, subjective complaints. In other words, they do take a look at all this, but only if you report it. So if there's anything that made it a little bit worse, the patient's age, the patient's body position and impact all make a difference. Notice it goes on to say, initial findings were consistent with a grade two sprain. Well, what is a grade two? Grade two says, well, for the first week, probably every day followed by about two weeks of three to three visits and so forth. But notice there's saying up to 20 to 29 visits. So that is certainly something that is very reasonable to treat within that length. But notice it's a grade two. What if you don't grade it? What is the assumption? It's probably a grade one. So here's something from the company Evacor that just highlights the grading. I think you're all familiar with it. Grade one is mild, grade two is moderate, meaning there's some more of a rupture, but not complete rupture, if you will, more pain and swelling. Grade three may be surgery. I would assume most things we treat with any length is probably going to be a grade two. So we must highlight it as such. Otherwise, the assumption is one, which means they don't need much care. Remember, grade one, slight stretching, some damage to the fibers, but more microscopic. Grade two is more moderate. There's partial tearing. There's actual laxity of movement there. And then, of course, grade three complete, where there's going to be complete laxity or it's flopping around. Obviously, grade three generally means we're not going to treat because they're going to need surgery. But at the same token, pain, swelling, bruising all make a difference. If you have a visual injury where there's bruising, I'm going to suggest take a quick picture of it, upload it to the file. That visual will give you something like, wow, that's a really more significant injury than would be something relatively mild. So I'm going to emphasize, please grade it 
because if you don't, the insurance will, and let's assume they're always gonna take the lesser. Remember, there's also the grading uh, uh, protocol through the Quebec study for whiplash. Zero, no complaints, grade one, stiffness, grade two. If you look at most patients, I think that are moderate to severe whiplash. If you notice grade three, I think fits. Neurological signs. How many patients have decreased range of motion, point tenderness, and some neural signs with maybe a decreased reflex, maybe some sensory changes? Grade three, pretty significant. That's going to be more than a simple number of visits. But again, if we're not the one highlighting it, that's where the problem is going to be. But is that all there is? And this is where I think we go wrong. You don't want to code just a radiculitis. If you code spinal radiculitis after an accident, that's fantastic, but can I get radiculitis without trauma? So therefore, I still want trauma as part of it, but think of it, soft tissue issues, facet syndrome, hypermobility, M2428 uh, would be the code for spinal hypermobility. How about nerve issues? There's codes for trauma to nerves, let alone just radiculopathy like M5413. How about curvature changes? You all are aware, you've seen it. Someone takes a cervical x-ray, there should be a nice C-shaped curve. All of a sudden now, that C-shape is reversed. What is that? At M4012, a reversal of that kyphosis, that super, super incide or superimposed on that injury increases the need for care. Here's what I'm getting to. Your diagnosis has to tell me a complete picture. What if there's instability? Again, nerve, I'll point out, disc things that can go on. Remember, there's traumatic codes for disc. And then, of course, headaches. Remember, traumatic brain injuries, post-concussion syndrome, or how about just post-traumatic headaches? And there's three codes, post-traumatic unspecified, acute, or chronic. Definition of chronic is 12 weeks or more. So if they've had headaches for 12 weeks, obviously much bigger issue. But I would assume most people have acute. How about this? Things that require these anomalies I just showed, generally increase the need for care one and a half to two times. So if you have these anomalies, that, well, I shouldn't say anomalies, these complications, comorbidities, it's going to increase the need for care. Think of it right now. I think we are really beginning to understand how comorbidities make a difference. Notice people whose health is compromised are dying from COVID. People whose health are not are not. And sometimes looking healthy doesn't mean you're healthy. So are there things going on with your patient that may compromise their recovery? If there is, I need that documented. Tell me something about it because an insurance job is to look and say, oh, it's mild. We don't want to have the, the patient be seen too much. You're always going to get a pushback. Well, here's other complications. Kissing spine, ankylosing vertebral hypertosis, Schmorl's nodes, osteoporosis, lordosis, kyphosis. You get the point. Anything that compromises the joint is going to compromise recovery. Well, where does this come from? Diagnosis. You have to have a proper diagnosis. Now, remember, every year it updates. This year, there was one code that updated that probably will play a role in uh, auto cases, and that's vertigo. You'll notice the code H814 is the new code, if you will, because it's just generic vertigo or dizziness. How many patients have dizziness post-accident? Quite a few. What should you be working up if that's the case, though? Do you want to think, hmm, maybe they're having concussion syndromes? Do we want to do at least an acute concussion evaluation? Maybe a referral? Depends. But I want to make sure we have the right codes. Always remember, get to the highest level of specificity. Don't use the wrong code. R51 is a fine code. That's headache, though. I would never use that in an auto case. I would be using the post-traumatic codes. That's not the highest level of specificity. It's not giving me the most severity. Remember, diagnosis has simple codes that are kind of just generic Monet's, complex ones that I call Rembrandt's. Notice these two paintings. The one on the left is a Monet, very pretty. The one on the right is a Rembrandt, also very nice. But notice, could you tell me who the person is in that picture on the left, the Monet? I don't think so. But could you tell me who the person is in the picture on the right? Well, sure, if you're familiar with Rembrandt, that's who it is. What I want you to think of, does my diagnosis fit more of a Monet? I want you to think in these terms. If someone has a sprain strain, disc bulge, and radiculopathy, that's a pretty significant injury. What if you just said it was neck pain, though? Would neck pain still be accurate? It would be, but it's not the best. I use this analogy because take a look. I was taught this from high school kids. It says here, do you think she's pretty? And she says, no, she's a full-on Monet. And she says, because from far away, it's good, but when you get close, not so good. I want you to think of it, 
symptom diagnosis are Monet. And if you're expecting any long-term intense care and that's what you're using, it's gonna be a problem. So be a better student of diagnosis. Give me what's really going on. So here's that list Sean talked about that you can get from him. Notice headaches, post-traumatic, acute and chronic. How about concussion? Notice TMJ, but strains and sprains. Notice cervical spine, all the different strains and sprains. Remember there's two codes, cervical sprain S13-4, cervical strain S16-1. My assumption is a patient's gonna have both. Why would I not code both? And you see the same thing for each area, cervical spine, okay? The nerve conditions. Now something I'll point out for the nerves though, is notice that there's codes that indicate trauma as well. So notice that we have cervical you know, pain disorders, radiculopathy, but you also can have things like sciatica, traumatic nerve, S14 codes would fit in there. Notice for thoracic spine, we have disc, cervical spine, we have disc. Code me something that paints me a picture. If you're thinking the patient needs four months of care, you better have a diagnosis and a condition that requires four months of care. I bet if many of you had someone in a moderate to severe accident, you want to know why sometimes they take long? Because it's not a simple sprain strain. It's more than that. And what I'm bringing up is, if you were to do an MRI of many people, I would say probably a third post-accident exhibits some disc bulging. Now, the disc bulging may not be very severe, but enough that's why it's not getting well in six weeks, as would be expected, because it's not just a sprained strain. So I'm saying to you, go through your codes, start to pick up things. Notice there's codes for myalgia. Now, myalgia probably is gonna be included with the muscle strain sprain, but what about the residual effect? Let's say this patient's still having a lot of tenderness three months, three months post-accident. I would now say that's a sequelae in the myalgia part. In other words, I'm trying to give what is occurring for this patient. Take a look here for things like kyphosis, the codes I mentioned earlier, postural or secondary. I would bet from a PI case, it's secondary. Notice spinal instability factors. How many times have you taken an x-ray where a person's had spondylolisthesis? That in and of itself is severe. Couple that on top of an accident, way over the top. How about scoliosis? If scoliosis is present, is that gonna make the recovery that much more difficult? Absolutely. Notice codes for pain, acute pain, chronic pain, particularly for long-term care. How about other things? What if the person has insomnia? You're probably not treating insomnia directly, but indirectly when they're in pain, they don't sleep well. Reduce their pain, they sleep better. Part of the issue that goes on. Notice we have spinal enthesopathy factors, things that could be related way post-accident. You're not gonna have enthesopathy right after an accident, but you will where you could maintain that for months and months, it just won't go away. It constantly gets irritated. Here's my whole point to this. Look at your diagnosis critically, and I want you to play reviewer. What I want you to do is read your diagnosis, and just based on the diagnosis, not knowing anything else, how many visits would you approve? Because here's where you're thinking, I know about my patient, I know their history. Well, that's all great. But if that's not reflected somewhere, whether it's a diagnosis or a report, it doesn't exist. So I'm not saying shotgun and diagnose 40 things, but I would suspect there should be at least two diagnoses for each region you're treating, maybe three. Why? Because there's probably not just a simple sprain strain. There's more than that. Think of how many people over the age of probably 35 that begin to exhibit spondylosis and degeneration. Now, did the accident cause that? No. But because it's there, does that mean it's gonna take a lot longer to get better? Think of it, why does a 70 year old in a car accident take six months to get better and a 15 year old takes a month? Is it just being old or is it all those things that occur to you as being older? So that's what I want you to think along the lines of is that does the diagnosis reflect what I, my expectations are for care? Remember strains and sprains though have a format. And of course, I'm hoping you're all familiar, but let's do it here. When you see these codes in this way, wouldn't you assume initial encounter means first visit and subsequent encounter means the follow-up? It would seem that way, but it's not. The initial encounter actually is very misleading because the initial encounter is not only the first visit, but all visits with active care. So I'll make a simple statement. You should have a, a designation on your sprain, strains the entire time you're treating the patient. If you are treating, it is an A. Why do I say that? Because notice what the D is. 
the D is the visit after the active phase. So I would say you're never going to use a D unless you're releasing the patient. However, what I think you might use on some patients is sequelae. I want you to think of this as potentially a probably prognosis style diagnosis. How many patients in an accident, that's more than just a simple fender bender, even though you've done a good job treating, you ever notice they still have some nagging issues? It's not perfect. Well, that is sequelae. Sequelae doesn't exist, however, unless you code it. So notice this example, I have myalgia of the neck, and why is the myalgia of the neck there? As the residual effect of the accident, S134XXS. The residual effect of this accident, this patient has maintained some myalgia. Now, does that mean they absolutely need a lot of care still? No, but it's gonna be periodically flare up a little bit more. What if after the accident, their curvature doesn't change? That sequelae as well, which means now that spine is not gonna function as well. What if there's hypermobility? In other words, I want also at the end, what is left over. If your patient is doing great, I'm happy, wonderful. But unfortunately, that's rarely the case. Unfortunately, when you injure something, it's not the same. And I always use this analogy. If you tear a piece of paper and then you put it back together very carefully, do you ever notice it almost looks exact? But if you look really closely, it's not. Well, the same thing happens with every injury. It can be pretty close but it's not. That's where rehab comes in. We're going to have to strengthen something else to balance that. And again, if we don't bring up those issues as sequelae, they don't exist. Remember, an attorney wants to settle the claim for as much as the patient deserves. And the better the settlement, the less likely we're going to get the call, oh, doc, the case didn't settle well. Can you take 20% off? I'm going to first look at what we've done. What did we do in our report or our treatment that helped to make sure the patient received a proper settlement. Remember, settlements aren't pain and suffering. It's payment for damages. Damages, lost time from work. Damages, inability to do your ADLs. What it's also damages for is residual need for care. When there is sequelae, I'm going to suspect that there's gonna be a certain number of visits you're gonna dictate the patient may need. Don't be afraid to write that. Do you think this patient's going to need two visits a month for the next six months? Ten visits over five months. Whatever it is, you put it down. Now, that doesn't make you absolutely correct, but based on your experience as an expert, it's the most reasonable way, and it's tangible. They can say, okay, if that's the case, we have to put another $1,000 because we need to cover the future needs of this patient. And so we have to do a better job to make sure if your patient is perfect, great. That's wonderful. They're not gonna get as big a settlement. Think of it. If you hit my car, I mean, you just bang, you hit it really hard. But then we go outside the car and there's literally no damage to the car, except maybe a teeny tiny scratch, just a little scratch, even though the impact was strong. How much is it gonna to cost to fix the car? Maybe $50, because they gotta buff out the scratch. So in other words, there's very limited damages. There has to be damages. Damages from the doctor is reflected by your diagnosis, by your prognosis, by your ability to tell me what the future needs of the patient are. If you don't say it, no one will, because the attorney can't, the insurance company can't. So unless we say it, the assumption there is nothing there. The other thing we have to do, of course, is examine patients before we even get to a diagnosis. I do want to highlight a couple of quick notes here. Be very, very careful with evaluation and management codes. And I say that because often providers think, hey, I'm going to bill a 99204 because it's a car accident. And frankly, that has nothing to do with it. A 99204 could be a car accident, but not necessarily. It depends on severity. So I want you to look here and you'll notice these codes will fool people a bit. Because if you look here, you'll notice each of these codes have a time value. And many people wind up thinking, well, hey, if I spend 45 minutes with a patient, does that mean I get to bill a 99204? No. A 99204 is really not about how much time you spend, because the time here is just typical. It's more about what you need to do to qualify. So this, this is where I want to go. I think more often on a PI, you probably should bill a 203. 
unless you can show me you qualify for a 204. Now, I'm not saying never ever, but not very likely. The other factor I'd focus on is on reavows. Most people build 213s, which I'm going to say is equally as wrong as building a 204. And let me explain why I say this. If you go back here, notice the 99203 says detail. It's a detailed level of exam, generally meaning you're taking enough of a history and you're dealing not just with one area, but areas that are contiguous at the very least or multiple areas. And it says it's a detailed exam. Well, a detailed exam takes 12 bullets. I'll explain that in just a moment. Well, let's take a look for an established patient. And I want everyone to notice what code is a detailed evaluation? 99214. Now, what I think is interesting here is most people assume a 99203 and a 99213 are the same level of exam, and they are not. Actually, a 99203 level exam, that's on a new patient, if you do that same exam on an established patient, it's a 214. So I want you to think for a moment, when you examine someone the first time, you're obviously going to go through a lot of factors. When you re-examine them, what are you going to go through? would you not go through those same factors? So my concern is some providers upcode and try to build this and should not, and more likely should go here, but then in turn, they downcode and build this code when in fact you're probably doing this one. And so here's what I wanna focus in on a little bit to give a quick primer on how should you choose these codes? Well, choosing these codes, they're based on the 1997 Evaluation and Management Guidelines. These are the latest edition. And I want you to notice something specific here. If you notice, 99203 and 214 says a detailed exam. And it goes on to say extended examination, you know, the affected area and, and the area surrounding. But it says something pretty unique here. It says at least two bullets from six or more organ systems or 12 bullets from two or more. Now, I'll focus on bullets here in a second, but bullets are exam things. So I wanna to start to say, when we examine someone, the exam code is really more based on the level of evaluation, which of course, the more severe and more history makes sense, but it's not about, oh, it was a car accident, it's a 204. It depends on what's wrong. Here's the part that's interesting. Notice it says at least two bullets from six organ systems, pretty straightforward 12 or 12 for many. So that's fairly easy to do. And I would suspect most chiropractors probably always do a 99203. However, notice 204. It also equates with the 05 and 15. And notice what it says uniquely here. It says two bullets from each of nine organ systems. Now, all of a sudden, that's far different than what we saw up here. Notice this one says, oh, give me 12 bullets from anywhere, basically, from two systems. Whereas this one says, no, you have to have nine organ systems and two bullets, which means, yes, it's 18, but notice how hard it is. Most chiropractors, honestly, will do probably 20 to 25 bullets on an exam. The problem is it's like three to four organ systems. So you'll notice this is why this one is so hard. In order to qualify for it, you have to examine nine organ systems, which frankly, we just generally don't do. The organ systems are these 15 areas, which I'm sure most are familiar. What I'll do is a quick cursory. What do we generally do? What organ systems? I will certainly say most chiros do constitutional, vital signs and general appearance of the patient. But think of it. For eyes, how many chiropractors do an eye exam outside of when you graduated? Now, I'm not saying you don't know how to use the ophthalmoscope and you never do, but do we do that very often? So I'm going to say no to that one. Well, let's take a look at the next one. Eyes, neck, nose, mouth, and throat. Do most chiros do that type of exam? Probably not. Now, I'm not saying never ever, but okay, we throw another organ system out. Now, if someone's had a whiplash or neck complaints after an accident, aren't we going to do a neck exam? I would think so. But I want everyone to see something here. This is not a musculoskeletal exam part. This is the observation of the thyroid, the larynx, the contours, their swelling or masses. I'm going to say to you, you of course should be looking at that because you want to rule out other things. So now I think we do have two organ systems, but do we do respiratory? I mean, let's face it, when's the last time you auscultated a lung when you graduated chiropractic college? Now again, I'm not saying never ever, but I'm saying typical. What about cardiovascular? Auscultating the heart? I'm gonna say no to that one too. 
So notice we're still at two organ systems and we're almost at the end of the first half of it. Quite frankly, who's doing a chest or breast exam? No one, what would be the purpose of that? I'm not saying we don't know how to do it. So you can see here, so far we have two organ systems. Well, let's move on, gastrointestinal. Probably not doing anything there. You might, look at the first thing, examination of the abdomen with tenderness. So if someone has low back pain, I think that might fit. And the general urinary male and female, we're not doing. I've not done that since I finished chiropractic college many years ago because it's the actual exam of the, of the genitals. Many of you do a review of systems, which I think you should do. That would include this, but please remember that's not an exam. So I'm gonna take these out. We move to the next area, lymphatic. When's the last time you did a lymphatic exam? We're not doing that. However, I'm gonna make one bid for this. Based on COVID and having the patient sign an informed consent and probably understanding they've not been sick, might it not be a bad thing for you to probably on any patient do a quick cursory palpation of the lymph nodes in the neck at the very least? I think that might be smart. Patients will feel safer. Certainly, you might start showing signs of illness in the lymph nodes long before you exert external signs that go beyond like coughing and so forth. Anyway, again, you'll notice, wow, Sam, we're still at two, I know. Now this is where we live. We do musculoskeletal. And this, of course, we do a lot. Realize there are four bullets that you do with a musculoskeletal exam, and I'll name the form for you, the four. Obviously, do you palpate a patient? That's a bullet. So anytime you palpate an area, that's one bullet per area. When you palpate, though, don't you look for tenderness? That would be a second bullet. Do you not look for muscle tone, spasm? That's a bullet. Range of motion is a bullet. So in other words, every time you do basically a palpatory exam of someone, that's gonna be four bullets per region. And if you notice, someone involved in a car accident often has head, neck, and low back. And if I have those areas affected, I'm gonna evaluate what's contiguous, which means the extremities. So I might do as many as 16 to 20 bullets here. Now notice we've done three organ systems, but if we're doing four bullets per region, we're probably 20 plus bullets right now. So you can see very clearly, does it fit a 203 or a 214? Absolutely. Notice how hard for a 204. Okay, well, let's move to the next thing. Skin, I don't think we're doing a lot there. I'm not saying you don't. Neurologic, sure. I think everyone does deep tendon reflexes, so another bullet. I do think we do assessment of orientation, time, place, and person. Here's what my point is to you. Take a moment to really look critically at your exam and evaluate whether or not is the level of exam that I have provided fit a 203 or does it fit a 204? I would venture to say very seldom will you do a 204. I'm not gonna say never, but seldom. However, I'm gonna conversely say, when you re-examine someone, don't you examine what you did before? Apples to apples. So if I do a 20 bullet initial exam, grant you I'm not gonna do all same 20 bullets like vital signs maybe I don't do, maybe I'm not going to do their general appearance again. So let's say out of 20 bullets, I eliminate six of them. I'm still doing 14. That still fits a 214. So I want everyone now to start say, I choose my code not based on what I think it is, but what I know I have done. So PI cases certainly are gonna do a lot of bullets because how many times do you have a patient that complains of everything? My neck, my shoulder, my elbow, my wrist. Before you get to it, you're gonna realize, my goodness, I am doing a lot of areas. This is the standard protocol and I kept saying about bullets and here's why. You'll notice this musculoskeletal exam, it breaks down every area you do, skin, neuro, uh, constitutional, musculoskeletal, and it does the bullets. What you would do is go through your bullets, count them to make sure you've done the right one. This is what I spend a lot of time in detail on at our seminar, because this is the compliance of coding. What I want to make sure is don't shortchange yourself. Remember, a 203 is still easily $180 to probably $220 in California. So you're not helping yourself by trying to build a $400 204. Just build a 280. And don't forget, prolonged service could still fit. Ultimately, here's what I want. Let's make sure we code it properly that we don't set off alarms. If you bill a 204, if I'm reviewing the claim or some, they're going to go, hmm, what makes them think it's a 204? Now, again, very severe accidents, I would say sure. But ones that are the moderate to moderate severe, maybe not. 
Now, the other factor, and this is the part I really want to make sure you take home. Diagnosis, yes, of course. E&M codes, yes, but it's the treatment. And I think we're all barking up the wrong tree of what we do. And I want to give you a scenario. As many of you know, my father was a chiropractor also. He never did massage. That wasn't what he did. Now, remember when the 80s hit, do we do a lot of massage? Why? Patients wanted it. They liked it and insurance paid for it. Are they paying for massage and those things as well now? No. Now, PI may be a little bit simpler for that, but I want to be careful. When patients have been involved in an accident, the goal is to restore them to pre-injury status. Has anyone ever been restored to pre-injury status by laying in bed and resting? No. Getting massage? No. What gets them there is an active care protocol. So I want to focus in on what insurances are indicating for active care protocols. Well, I do want to do CMTs here to make sure, obviously, a chiropractor is going to adjust people. It's what we do. It's what's unique. I do want to say, in California, do you have to adjust someone every visit? You do not. It's anticipated. It's part of the care plan. And though we may do it mostly, it's not something you must do every visit. Remember the codes, 98940, one to two regions, 98941, three to four, 98942 is five, and 98943, extra spinal. Do remember extra spinal. It doesn't matter how many regions, it's just one time. The big takeaway I wanna focus here though is, and I have this happen on PIs all the time, the doctor's billing a 98941, but he only has two regions diagnosed. Remember these codes are by the diagnosis and regions. You have to have both. Your technique does not dictate. If you do activator and you adjust everything, extremities on up, you still get to bill only a 98940. And the reason why, the diagnosis was cervical. So do always make sure it matches what you've diagnosed. You have to adjust it and diagnose it. Technique is not the driver. If you do Gonstead, diversified, obviously you may adjust the full spine, but if you code only two regions, still a 4-0. Please make sure too, documentation-wise, always document the regions. The only one that requires the vertebra is Medicare, and PI is not Medicare, so who cares? But you do still want to indicate I adjusted cervical, thoracic, so on. Now, what I want to focus on here, though, is we get adjusting, and adjustments fit any phase of care. But what I want to focus on here is how we're treating patients. Obviously, people need passive care. Treatment provided is to alleviate pain and is directed to limit the extent of injury, reduce signs and symptoms. So is passive care necessary on personal injury? Oh my goodness, yes. Patient comes in, they're tight. They are in a lot of pain. They're muscle guarding. Okay, there's inflammation. That all makes sense. The problem is, how long does it take for that to remove? If you're still treating those acute symptoms after two weeks and certainly after four, I'm going to let you in on a secret. It's not working. And insurances are becoming privy to that. So you want to remember that it's passive care, yes, but we want to go to an active. Treatment for active is provided to focus on improving pain-free ranges of motion and restoration of function to the fullest extent possible. So here's why I'm putting this. This is your treatment plan. You need a plan that they can see as reasonable. Notice I brought it up earlier from AIS. Where are they looking to see you go? It's not just, hey, I'm going to give them. If you're doing passive care, the whole course of care, I'm going, why? If you're doing electric stim on visit 20, I'm going to ask you, what are we still doing it for? Oh, I'm doing it for pain. I'm doing it for swelling. If you're still dealing with significant pain and swelling that long in, it's not working. Let's be honest with ourselves, it's not. In fact, we want to try to do more active care. In fact, it says treatment providers directed to focus on promoting the restoration of strength, endurance, and performance, get them back. Can you imagine if someone had an ACL injury and your protocol was to put ultrasound and ice? How much is that gonna help in the long term? In the short term, I'm not going to take that away, but in the long term, how is that going to stabilize and strengthen that area? It's not. So here's what I want you to think of. You're going to start with relief care. That is passive. Move to therapeutic care, which is more about restoration of function 
and then ultimately to a full rehab where we're getting maximum medical improvement. In doing so, I want you to look at a couple of studies here. This is from whiplash disorder, and it says whiplash associated disorders include a range of symptoms related to the neck and head. Okay, we get it. They commonly occur after a motor vehicle accident, and notice it says there is good evidence to suggest that active exercise, acting as usual, and, or acting as usual in a combination therapy are the most effective. So notice the studies show it's better to do active care sooner than later. And I'm not, I'm going to say I'm forgetting reimbursement. I don't care reimbursement at this point. I will in a moment. But what they're saying is, as soon as you can, you should involve active care because it is the best way for the patient to recover. In fact, the National Center for Biotechnology Information had a, a report that came out that says they recommend implementing range of motion exercises immediately to reduce pain levels and function. In fact, it says systemic reviews found exercise range of motion scapular strengthening is beneficial as relieving the neck pain. Meta analysis concluded that specific exercise, such as neck stabilization, showed significant short term effects on pain levels. So, in other words, does exercise help pain? Does it help to rehab? So here's what I want you to start thinking of. Do you really want to continue doing a lot of passive care that can be easily shown as not being effective? Or would you prefer to do the active care that is what shows to be effective? Now I'm going to talk about reimbursement. Do you get paid more for passive therapies or active therapies? I sit back and go, why are we fighting for passive therapy that doesn't pay that much and they want to fight us about it as opposed to doing active. We want to retrain our patients. They're not coming to a spa. Maybe the first week or two, we got to get them calmed down. I get it. They're coming in to rehabilitate their problem. So yes, some passive care, a little heat, a little stim. I get it. Remember all those codes are one unit regardless of how much you do. When you do other types of passive care, remember this is electric stim. They're timed but they're still considered passive. The same applies with laser. Do remember auto insurances generally will be more likely to pay laser than most, but still not very well, so be careful. I do wanna highlight one of these here. 0552T is a new code for laser, and just as a sidelight, I think we may see a little bit more coverage. This is not so much PI. Believe it or not, the VA under VA choice is covering that, so we may get some action there. The thing you're probably gonna focus on though, that's the hands-on, not modalities, but therapeutic procedures. What I wanna focus here though is, why are we so in love with massage and manual therapy? Here's the difficulty I have with those codes. Number one, what's the difference? Here's what I wanna make sure, make it definitive why you're doing one or the other. Massage, afterus petrosage, we get it. What's the purpose of massage? Probably relaxation. What's the difference of manual therapy? Well, manual therapy is more deep tissue, we often say, but what does that mean? Soft tissue mobilization, strain counter, what does that actually mean? Well, here's the American Physical Therapy Association definition. It says, manual therapy techniques are skilled hand movements and skilled passive movements. It can be a combination of joints and soft tissue intended to improve tissue extensibility. So the difference is massage, relaxation, circulation, pain modulation. Manual therapy is not for that. Manual therapy is to restore movement. So the purpose of the hands-on work is more about what it's accomplishing, not how it's done. There's certain times you could see manual therapy and massage being done and you couldn't tell the difference, except when you realize, oh, one of them is working on that adhesion to break it up so that there's greater motion. Here's the big problem I have with both these codes, documentation of it. You have to document where am I doing it, what am I doing it, and for how long. And of course, here's the biggest problem. In order to be paid for these two passive therapies, they have to be done in a region you're not manipulating. So here's the problem. If someone has a neck injury, where are you going to adjust them? The neck. If you're going to adjust the neck and they have a neck injury, where are you likely to do the massage? The neck, which, okay, here's the problem, not payable, unless it's a separate area. So here's an example of a bill, and I want you to notice this is one that would be payable. Notice diagnosis A and B is cervical. Then when I move over here to diagnosis C and D, these are lumbar. So notice on the bill, 98940 is going to the cervical spine. 
97124 going to the lumbar spine. That is payable. Here's the problem. I can do that, but do we? Do we mostly focus in on the same regions? Now, some personal injury insurances can be more lenient than others, but you're gonna notice a pushback on this. So is it really worth your while to be doing a lot of massage that's included with the adjustment? Unless you can do a separate area or a separate visit, I'd be very careful. Maybe the first week or two, the patient's in so much pain, maybe you do just do massage and don't adjust. That could be reasonable. Then move on to adjustment. What I wanna focus on though is, let's do therapeutic procedures. We just saw a guideline that said, Therapeutic procedures are the things that they want, shows more effect. Anything could be a therapeutic procedure if it involves movement and strengthening. In fact, the hardest part is deciding what's the difference. If I had a person doing exercises where they have the rope moving up and down, would you call that an exercise or is it a therapeutic activity? And I'll give an example. What if this person has a job where they have to work construction where they're moving their arms up and down? If the movement is to help that ability, it's a therapeutic activity. If I'm just doing it for generic strength, it's exercise. So remember, the important part here is the exercise, the code, is gonna more depend on what you're doing. So this activity, like I just shown, would you call that exercise or, or a therapeutic activity? That's kind of my point. It's more about what it is. So let's talk about the reimbursement. What has the best reimbursement? Therapeutic activities. Why? because they require the greater amount of expertise and therefore have more value. Could you have a staff person? Yeah. So I'm going to say to you, document the exercise you're doing. Focus more on that. Technically, under what's called the medically unlikely edits, do you know it's indicated that you can do up to eight units of exercise in one session? I don't think we need to do that much, but I'm just saying that could be, depending on the circumstance. So here's my focus. Exercise, simple. It's exercise, strength, flexibility, endurance. All the stuff you picture a person doing at a gym or even doing on their own, exercise ball. The key is making sure you're there with them and making sure they're doing it properly, safely. So what do you document? The exercises, sit-ups, back extensions, neck bridges, you name it. Tell me the reps, the sets, the time. I don't need to write that every time, but just the number of minutes they spent doing it. And I wanna highlight something here. I want everyone to think for a moment, what is your price for an adjustment, a regular 98940? Now, do you have that price in mind? I wanna know what is your price for exercise? And here's why I say that. Take a look at the bottom here. You're gonna notice the relative value unit or the cost of exercise or uh, an adjustment is 0.8. Notice the exercise code is 0.87. So I want you to think for a moment. If you're billing $50 for an adjustment, which I would say is on the lower end, most probably charge 60, but if you're charging 50, what should be your fee for 97110? It should be approximately 7% higher. Now, does that mean a lot higher? No, but it does mean it's 53. I want you to think for a moment, how many of you are billing a fee for exercise that is below your fee for an adjustment? Makes no sense. You have something worth more, but you charge less. So know your values. Well, what about this? Notice what it says. Daily treatment documentation for exercise must be the specific body part treated, the type of exercise and the time. And notice it does say there must be some evidence that the patient could not tolerate or do them at home. Obviously, once you do the exercises for two weeks, you're gonna to have to do progression because if you're doing the same thing, I go, well, the patient should do it at home. Think of it like any person that works out, it's progressive. And you know, it's not that you do more every time, but over time, progressive resistant. You lift heavier and heavier, more sets, more reps. That's where it comes in and where you may do a bit more, just document it. Well, what is therapeutic activities? How is it different? Well, therapeutic activity is more of an ADL. So if you're doing exercises that are more focused on function, and in fact, for some of the older docs, remember when we used to have the code that's called it functional activities? That's really what these should be called because that's what it is. It's exercise specifically for function. And here's what I think. I think we do more of that than we do exercise. Because most often I bet you're designing a program for your patient that's not just a generic, everyone does this. It's something specific for them. And I wanna point out something. The RVU for this is 1.15. Do you know what that's equivalent to? That's equal to 98941. 
So if you're doing therapeutic activities, the price of that should be equivalent to your 401, which probably for most offices is in the 70 to probably $80 range. So again, you're fighting for a therapy that they're gonna beat you up on that you can't win, that's passive. If you do active, how could they tell you no? It's what it's shown. The one I would be careful of is neuromuscular education. There are times for it, but notice this person, he's young and healthy. That's not neuromuscular education. Just because he's working out on a challenging object doesn't make it. Remember, vibration plates aren't neuromuscular education. It's vibration. There's no code. Could it make the exercise more challenging? I think so, but by itself doesn't make it. Here's my point. Neuromuscular education, frankly, is exercise, but it's exercise not to strengthen, but for balance and coordination. So here's an issue I wanna bring up. If you don't have patients with a loss of deep tendon reflexes, vibration stents, paresthesia, loss of balance, why are you doing it? Take a look here. It says clearly, CPT code 97112 is intended to identify therapeutic exercise. So in other words, it is exercise, except notice what it says. It may be considered medically necessary if at least one of the following conditions is present. Notice loss of deep tendon reflexes, vibration stents, paresthesia, burning. Notice, in other words, significant nerve injuries. I'm not going to, if you have a patient with it, I'm all in. But unless they have that big a deficit, don't use it. And here's why I would also tell you that. The value of 97112 is approximately the same value as exercise. Why fight it? If it's functional, build therapeutic activities. If it is straight exercise, build exercise. This would be a code I would avoid unless you clearly have a clear neurologic deficit that you're attempting to restore. Making the exercise harder by having a person stand on a BOSU ball doesn't make it that. It just makes the exercise more challenging. The other thing I wanna conclude with is this. Chiropractic works well when you're treating a patient for an extended time. If you're treating someone within four to six weeks, I don't think anyone's gonna sweat that for the most part. But if you're treating someone for 12 weeks or more, please start using some type of outcome assessment. I like this one, it's called a general pain index. I'm not a big fan of the Oswestry because the Oswestry, as good as it is, patients don't like it. They don't fill it out well. And therefore it's not used well because they're all over the place. If you're gonna use an Oswestry, fill it out with the patient or have staff do it. What I like about this one is it just gives me six functional things, family, home, recreation, social. A zero means I'm good. A 10 means I'm a mess. You know what we're looking for? A total. It's functional. When the patient comes in, their total is going to be high, 50 plus. After two weeks of care, guess what's going to happen? It's going to drop. And here's what we have now. We have a definitive measurement to know when we're going to release that patient. We're probably not trying to treat to zero, folks. What you know we're going to try to treat to? Single digits. Once they get to single digits, we're expecting they're okay. By the way, on a pain scale, if it's not greater than three, be careful. Three is the minimum level to consider that there needs to be care. If your patient says the pain is a two, that means they don't need care. So make sure you qualify. If they say it's a two, what does a two mean to them? Some people have a 10 and they're almost fully functional. Other people are gonna have a three and could be a big mess. So focus more on the function. Your care works, but do we demonstrate it? So to bring it back full circle, I want you to think along the lines of, do I have the diagnosis that match the level of care that I'm doing with the coding I'm using? Did the exam match it? Here's my goal. Help me help you. I'm the one on the back end that defends these things that when we're going through it. I can if you give me the tools. Focus on functional change. Now, I'm not saying they gotta go to a CrossFit gym, no. But I'm saying, Tell me what they can do now that they couldn't do with the accident. That's better. And over time, when they get fully back, maybe they don't have full function. What I want you to create is a sense of, I've got treatment protocols that make sense that no one ever fights. You know why I have all those documents that show the different things? Because these are offices denied. You're treating the patient too long for the condition. And I won't take away the patient probably needed it, but here's the problem it's not documented in a way that anyone can see it. So your documentation's always gotta match. If it's severe, I should be able to see that in the notes. 
So here's what I want to do for everyone. I want to make sure that I can create a protocol for you. We do a service called a network. Our network service is your best bet beyond the seminar. I think even better because when you join it, you can call me, you can email me, you can fax me unlimited for an entire year on any and everything. I will review your notes. I will talk about your treatment protocols. I'll help you with denials. I'll help you figure out coding. We're here to help. My expertise is one as a coding and billing expert, and I've seen a lot of things and want to pass that on to you, but I also can be helped to you on a day-to-day -day basis. Basically for $250, so long as you use the coupon code at the bottom, I'll be part of your office for an entire year. So you want to think along the lines of about 70 cents a day to have a billing expert on staff. We also provide a lot of seminars. And what I always say at my seminars, I'm a workout guy. I want to give your practice muscles. Do you have the right tools? So take a look here. If you come to a live seminar, use this coupon code. It'll give you 40 bucks off. Just type in return 2020 or use the coupon code for our network as I showed or for our digital coding. Take a look, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we always try to provide the latest news and things that's going on. I'm gonna give you one quick tip here, this is goes beyond. How many are you aware that of course you know that you can do telemedicine, right? Can you do telemedicine for PI cases? You could. However, are you limited to E&M codes? For many insurances, but do you know for some insurances, you can bill for exercise, therapeutic activities, gait training, and neuromuscular education via telemedicine. That's a tease. Join the network, come to a seminar, learn more. Here's our goal. I wanna thank Sean for, for having me in. I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to be here. I hope this last you know, hour and a half, two hours has been worth your while. If you have issues, take a look at the network. We're there to help. We're here for you. Come to a seminar. Our goal is to fortify you, make you a better practice. PI is the place. Truthfully, if you want to think of it, where is there always insurance money? PI cases. Because even if your patient doesn't have med pay, if the other party's at fault, who's going to pay? You just have to make sure it's a good claim. And that's why you want to get attorneys like Sean to help you. Because if you don't, you're going to get burned. Anyway, that's it for me, Sean. I want to say thank you. I appreciate all of you and I hope to see you all soon. Be safe and be healthy. Thank you, Sam. And uh, thank you doctors for joining us today. Uh, if you have any questions, any requests, please uh, email us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Take care.